much. Your own diet looks an option. It's really boring. I won't hold the grudge against you. Yeah, you, you in the back, especially. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk today about non-vulnerable dependency resolution. And uh, that's our agenda. So quick, quick words about me. I like to think I'm on a mission to make it easier to use more free and open source software, more efficiently using free and open source software tools and open data. Uh, and I build a few tools like ScanCode, which is fairly popular, and also a few standards like PackageRL, which end up being fairly essential to uh, many of the, the things that exist for uh, S-Bound software composition analysis. It's essential to CycloDX. It's also part of SPDX, which I did uh, in part of And so that's the, the space we are um, as a result, we build tools to analyze all these, trying to figure out what could we use in a package, the system, app, container, where it's coming from, what's license, are there security issues. And the, the, the talk today is going to be uh, uh, about keeping the victim Vikings out of the gate. Uh, and you, you see my great skills about building deep fakes here at play uh, and you can recognize probably the, the face of our three hosts um, and uh, no way I was used there actually <laughs> um, all right so the problem is dependencies I think we've built a wonderful food gun where we can now super easily provision and install random software and pretend that we have some control on it um, and that everything is going to be okay. Um, as a result, we have potentially license issues, security issues, but also many more. Um, and that's where we are. It's wonderful, we can provision 400 NPMs with NPM install food. Uh, but what we're doing and how to deal with the problem afterwards is what we're trying to, to help here. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with dependency resolution. I'm assuming you are. And what I mean by dependency resolution is being able to have typically package manifests, uh, be it system packages like Debian, RPMs, uh, and similar, or application package like Maven, NPM, IPI, um, and you say I have a direct dependency on say Django and I want version 4 or higher. Or I want Log4j version 2.0 or higher. That's a typical thing. We, we call these requirements or constraints. And each of these dependencies has themselves further dependencies with version constraints, and so on, and so on, all the way down. And this form is eventually complex graph. Um, not necessarily graph without cycles, and not necessarily graph without uh, redundancies. And the resolution process is trying to find what is the less problematic set of package and package versions in this graph that you may want to install. And how these tools work is that they fetch from a, an upstream package repository, say the NPM registry, the list of versions which are known for a package version. And they try to pick one of these, get progressively all the dependencies, and try to find a solution. Uh, there's a bunch of complex tools to do this resolution. They're called SAT solvers. Not all the dependency resolvers use set solvers, but RPM is one that's uh, using one. Um, I think Maven is using one too at some level. The, the, the thing is, uh, eventually you don't have really control, direct control on, on what's being resolved unless you're extremely really careful. Um, some of them like to pick random versions. Sometimes the latest, sometimes the uh, uh, 
all this version that match requirements depends on which environment. Gaining on the latest bandwagon is often considered a good solution, but not always. I mean, you, you've heard about uh, XZ recently. Being on the beginning edge was not the best thing to do in uh, Debian testing or Debian stable or Arch Linux, for instance. So that depends resolution. Any questions on that? You guys are, are all about. Okay, good. All right, now let's look about dependencies. Uh, uh, from another angle, which is vulnerabilities. We have what's called CVs, which is a common approach to uh, give a number to a known software vulnerability. It stands for common vulnerability exposure or enumeration, something like that. And the principle is very similar. In the sense you say that uh, OpenSSL has this vulnerability which describes some way to leverage OpenSSL uh, that impacts versions which are higher than this version, but not this version, and, and so on and so on. So you have something which assembles a lot. The uh, constraints and version range we have uh, when it comes to, to actual dependency management. And uh, uh, just, just a side note actually, if, uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that are out there. And we built a small tool uh, called VolTotal, which you give a package and it goes queries on these different vaults databases and try to find how they agree or not. And it's really sad that they don't agree on, on basic things like which is the version that's vulnerable and which is the version that are not vulnerable for package. Uh, so that's a problem. But the point is that we have something which at the high level resembles a lot the, the, the version range we are talking to for dependencies. Alright, so we've talked about dependencies, vulnerable ranges. Now let's introduce a new thing which is called Perl or package URL. I don't know if any of you have heard about this. Show of hand quick. Okay, a few. So, uh, you, you see a few examples here. Package URL is a very simple string, basically name and version of package using common syntax, such that uh, you know that file on npm is not the same thing as file on Debian. And it's something that uh, I'm very proud of because we started in, in, in uh, my open source project, and is, is de facto standard used across all the tools and SBOM spec today. Um, and so it's a way to have a common syntax to identify a package. In a way it's probably even more useful than an SBOM because if you have two different SBOM formats that all talk using package URLs, then you'll be able to uh, combine this with other tools because you have a common identifier for a package. Remember here we have with the CV, a command identifier for a vulnerability. Command identifier for a vulnerability, command identifier for a package. Um, there's discussion, by the way, to, to also even uh, include that in the next version of the, the US National Vulnerability Database, called the NPD, in version 5.1. And some quotes from a, a VP of the Linux Foundation there. Um, it's interesting, it was really, it happened by, almost by, uh, uh, as, as a side effect, we just need something for our tools and it happens to be useful for many, uh, many ones. It speaks a lot to, to the benefits of building things in the open, by the way. Okay, let's introduce yet another topic, which I call verse or version range specification. Um, it's a new small standard that's part of the package URL spec. Um, so new, it's not even merged yet, so it's, I need to merge that some kind of time pretty soon. And the idea is to express the syntax for version ranges in a way that's not specific to NPM or PyPI or Debian or RPM or else. Just use the same syntax across the board. 
there is no way to go beyond the syntax because each package ecosystem uh, has a very devilish way to deal with versions. Uh, for instance, if you use a star in a nugget package, it's going to influence how the resolution of the events is done and whether it's the oldest or newest version of a range that's picked. Uh, that's not the case if you use a star in, in NPM or PyTI. So there's a lot of uh, uh, specifics on each of these the semantics of the, the versions and how to compare versions to version. It's surprisingly super complex. Here we're not trying to uh, hide or mask that, but just trying to find at least a common simple syntax. In this case, I'm saying here I have a version range which says it's version 1 to 3 or uh, it has to be superior to 0 or inferior to, to, to 5. It defines a range, just a compact way to express a range. Plus, npm here describes the standards and the way two npm package versions are used. You would say, oh, it's easy, it's using semantic version of same verb. Actually, it's not using semantic same version of same verb exactly, it's using what's called node semantic version, node same verb, which is a slight take with a few corner cases, which is not exactly same verb. All right. Let's move to something else. So we've talked about dependency resolution, vulnerabilities, package identifiers, version ranges. Now, let me introduce a new tool, which is called Python Inspector, which is a, a way to resolve dependencies. The same way if you're familiar with a Python tool like pip, or poetry, or set of tools, uh, you can install a package uh, and when you install package, the whole tree of dependencies is going to be resolved for you and installed. Here, it's essentially the same approach, except it doesn't install anything. You give it name and version or a set of requirements, and it's going to run the dependency resolution and give you back the set of versions that would be installed uh, if you were to install them. It doesn't install anything. So it's more of a way to, uh, to do a simulated dependency resolution behind the scene it's using the exact same tools that are used by, uh, by PIP in the Python universe. It's using the same internal resolver library. Uh, and the, the thing about it is that it takes package URLs and version range as, as an input. Um, and basically now, if we put everything uh, together, you still need and need one more thing. Um, this one thing is to have a volunteer database. The problem with CVEs that we discussed about uh, earlier on is that they use a not real really, but something called CPE, which is an identifier for a product. Um, and this is an identifier for a product and product version that's supposed to be impacted by vulnerability, which comes from an age when uh, the main vulnerabilities that were tracked were for uh, Microsoft Windows and Adobe Acrobat and everything was owned by a vendor. And in the world of open source, there's no such thing as really a vendor for a package and a project. It's a project, uh, but we're talking more about the, the actual code that's being delivered than who actually wrote it, which is uh, in many ways similar. So Perl are really interesting because you can just look at code, and just by looking at code, you're able to figure out and find out what is the, the package name and version. It's very of use if you're running in uh, uh, NPM or Ruby or PyTI or else. Um, so here what we have is a bond database, which is keyed by this package URL. So instead of using the, the standard or the common CP uh, identifier for software as used in the National Multi Database and historically in many of the volunteer databases. Here we're saying no, uh, we're looking first at the package. And there's very little discrepancy and dependency mismatch between what you can observe in the code you use 
and looking up in homes that is historically you always had to do uh, yet another step to to be able to actually do this kind of uh, lookup where you need to do a, you need to do a search and and then find what would be the corresponding city and the problem there to give you an idea uh, historically the vendor, so vendor would be something you need to know, the vendor for Zilive was GNU. And that's not really obvious because that was just a given name and it's never been a new project that's been maintaining Zilive. Uh, it's been Mark Adler and, and, and the like, mostly Mark Adler. But just to give you a bit of an idea of the difficulties to relate to a package you see used and a package that may have one this and how you make search there. So what we have with this database is a way to aggregate vulnerabilities from the national, national vulnerability database, but also a project called OSV from Google called the Open Source Vulnerability Database and the GitHub Advisories and, and the one from GitLab, but also uh, more recently the GIC, new LiveC library, became uh, and started to publish their own advisories. And that means also ensuring that we work with GIC to collect the data and integrate that so we have uh, the, the information upstream from the horse mouse. It's actually surprisingly difficult because, uh, for instance, we, we integrate data straight from Nginx. And it took about us two months of discussion, discussing back and forth with the Nginx maintainers to understand what they meant in their security advisories. They don't have a lot of security issues, uh, but they have a very peculiar way, undocumented, to present the version ranges and determine which version of Nginx was vulnerable or not. Um, two months. It sounds like nobody ever had asked them before, so it's a bit surprising, but it's kind of work we're trying to do with the, the project themselves. And same thing with GLIC, uh, they have never had anyone use their vulnerability advisories before we, we started discussing with them a couple of months ago, uh, because the stuff was completely impossible. So it wasn't making sense and could, be, could not be really processed safely uh, uh, with code. Uh, so the point is, aggregating all this data, and then putting it together uh, in simple uh, centralized database so you can correlate information. And, and for instance, you may not have a, a separate information available for an RPM, but it may be available for Debian for the same vulnerability and same package. So by doing that, you're able to have better information and, and be able to get uh, more details uh, actually more details so you can uh, find and discover relationships that exist between different instances and variations of the same package. Um, eventually we also have this tool I've talked a bit earlier on which is able to compare this data with what exists in proprietary database. All right. <laughs> So now let's let's enter NPDR, uh, which is as I like to keep say uh, keep the, the barbarians at the gate. And, and once again, it's one of our hosts, uh, uh, and it's a bit better. It's still not uh, deep fake and and uh, any ideas. It's just a bit of gimp and uh, and smudge. But uh, it's it's like a quintessential peeking to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> the, the... Yes, you have a question? <laughs> that's, that's you, right? <laughs> this is you. Anyway. Alright, so, now, what if you could blend the things we discussed earlier, meaning the range of versions that are vulnerable, with the range of functional dependency constraints you have. That is, uh, you have certain versions that you know work for uh, your, your app that you've tested. 
and you could inject all of these into a dependency resolver, then eventually you have what I call a non vulnerable dependency resolution. And then you are able to run the combined resolution on the range of versions and the range of vulnerable versions to avoid vulnerabilities. And we have a, a proof of concept that's been implemented in this Python inspector together with a, a paper I like quite often to publish what I call the defensive publications uh, when I think there's an idea that's interesting that could potentially be patented. Making a publication that patent reviewers can look at and on this TV Commons website is a good idea. Um, because it ensures that nobody can run away with the ID by claiming they, they came with it first. E eventually, it's just an ID and a tool. I hope that each and every package manager will implement that in the future. For instance, PyTI now provides dependence, not dependency, but provides vulnerability information when you do an API call to their API. <coughs> Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, it's the case also in NPM. But to that, I don't know. I don't know why, but there's not been the step down to actually go from uh, getting the dependencies, getting the volunteers, and merging them together to get uh, hopefully less vulnerable uh, resolution. Okay, so if you put everything together uh, at once. What do you have on the one end, in the upper left corner, uh, national vulnerability database and many other vulnerability information aggregated. And they're being normalized, so they can refer to a normalized version range and normalized identifier for a package, package URL. So that's one area. The second thing is that you have potentially many different package registries and ecosystems. Uh, we've talked about Python, but uh, you have Ruby, Java, uh, R, like we were talking earlier today, and we Scrum. Um, we refer to these as repositories or registries. And each of the package there have specific dependencies on other packages, each of them dependent on specific versions. And same thing, we normalize each of the package identifiers to package URL and normalize the range to version range. And then eventually the non-vulnerable dependency resolution gets the normalized data from the vulnerability database, gets the version range and the functional dependency range from the uh, Python registry, in this case the, the ecosystem registry in general. And applying the resolver, you end up having something which is a non vulnerable dependency resolution. All right. So, uh, what to make of this? Um, so, what's the use of this? One of the main use is to uh, do what if scenarios. So, for instance, I am about to select and install a new package. Will I be able to get a set of dependencies that are not subject to non vulnerabilities? It's going to be super important in the upcoming uh, CRA requirements, the Cyber Resiliency Act, where you're not supposed to ship software uh, that has known security issues. That's basically the extent of what the, the European regulation says it's going to be interesting to see how it applies in practice to each and any of us that, that work in software development. Um, it's a requirement mostly for commercial companies that ship software commercially. Uh, so being able to understand whether you do that, but also do that on a regular basis. Uh, the other case is you know that you have a software that has a non vulnerability and what's going to be your path to remediation? What would be the tree of dependencies that you could resolve that would have the minimal impact on the rest of your app and 
you could eventually see a way where you could automate that to test uh, do my test still pass? I mean, do I, does my code still run uh, if I change my dependencies and resolve a different tree with different set of versions? And because dependencies ver change with each version, you, you may have not only different set of versions, but you have a complete dependency tree that's different each time you change version. Okay, so that's the, the, the first uh, typical usage today. Uh, it's going to be difficult. The, the reason why is that in practice there are so many vulnerabilities and they're so poorly documented is that uh, you may in many cases not be able to find a tree of dependencies that satisfies not being vulnerable. Um, so, how do you go beyond this? Uh, one of the ways to say there's other information that you can include beyond just the version range and feed the dependency resolver, such as uh, what is the known severity of vulnerability? So there's a bunch of scoring systems for that. Uh, there's one called CVSS, which has its pros and cons, but it's, it's widely established. So you could uh, put criteria beyond just the version range saying, hey, you know, I want to have only severities beyond, uh, say, 0.5 or, or 5, it's, it's a scale from 1 to 10, uh, under 5 or under 3. That could be one way to look at it. There's also scores um, in the same domain, a new thing called EPSS, which means uh, exploitability prediction scoring system or something like that, which is a dynamic score that's changed on the, the day basis, which is supposed to uh, help predict if a vulnerability is really exploitable. You could say, well, I want only to uh, consider dependencies in my tree that will not be exploitable, that would have a certain exploitability level or score below a certain threshold. Um, that would be another way. Um, if you think in the context of a specific deployment, it could be that this dependency, say log4j, 1 to 17, that you use is used in a test tool internally. So the context of how you use a product and how you use a piece of software may impact a lot on whether you need to remediate or not. And, and being able to take that into account in your dependency resolution, so the context of usage will be yet another way you could uh, 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 take advantage of uh, uh, extensions of these uh, resolution capabilities. Uh, another thing that's called reachability. So reachability is the idea to say there is no vulnerable code, say a function that has uh, the vulnerable code and express the vulnerability. If this function call graph is not reachable from your code, then there's fewer chances that you may be subject to the vulnerability. And if there's fewer changes, then you may uh, lower the priority of remediation and therefore make decisions about whether or not uh, uh, you want to do the remediation in your dependency resolution. Um, there's also change, things that could be interesting, especially when you're, you're about to select a package or on a continuous basis, is uh, if there's a package that becomes uh, out of maintenance or end of life, like it's called in the commercial world. There's more and more package, open source package that uh, eventually uh, fall out of maintenance. And it's really important to understand what we can make of these uh, because uh, there are risks to the same extent, uh, they can be, I mean, they can be obviously, if you've seen exactly uh, the problem when you have a project which has less interest in the maintainer, there's eventually somebody else that can take off and, and, and commit bad things. So understanding what the liveliness of a package or project, whether there's uh, eventually 
reaching some end of life or of maintenance is also the same. Same thing, license. Um, maybe there's ways to resolve license or inject license constraints and requirements in your tree. Um, if I develop GPL software, I surely want to avoid as hell to have commercial and proper software in my tree. Um, but in many cases, I may want to avoid having a dependency, say, on a certain version of uh, Redis or um, Elasticsearch, uh, because these are no longer open source, and that would apply, that would apply so, uh, regardless of whether I'm uh, uh, building free software or commercial proprietary software. So that's, that's pretty much it. So what we're doing beyond this? Um, we're working to extend this beyond Python to have support for Java and JavaScript. That's the, the short-term goals. And after that, to build a generic uh, dependency resolver, which is able to uh, resolve the dependencies irrespective of its, uh, of its ecosystems. And so if you think a bit about the, the, the stuff we were discussing earlier on, for dependency resolution, you need to get a list of packages and their known versions. Once you have that, you can apply, and you have that in a normalized fashion with a normalized version range, normalized modifiers. You can then do dependency resolution eventually in a, a mode and way that's independent of the specific of the ecosystem. But the specific of the ecosystems are definitely uh, maddening. Again, for instance, uh, when I install Python package, by default, the latest version of the branch will be used. If I upgrade the Python package, the oldest possible version that satisfies the branch will be used. So the context is going to be different. Go, for instance, always doesn't provide branches for versions. It's always a minimal version. And it's always trying to find the oldest possible version that satisfies the different constraints. And NuGet, depending on which version of NuGet you use, will pick the latest version or the oldest version. All the kind of small things which are really uh, difficult, but that, that are eventually uh, a way to, uh, to deal with, if you can deal with a generic dependency resolver. Uh, it's also interesting in the way it will expose all these different uh, issues to uh, all the package manager and package authors, so they, they may potentially evolve towards something which is a bit less, uh, uh, a bit less uh, crazy left and right. And uh, last, uh, we are building also uh, something called, as a moniker from our federated code, because we're talking about data, uh, package versions, vulnerabilities, package metadata. There is a big problem today where most of the database that aggregate these information are proprietary. And we're talking about database which are proprietary about metadata for free and open source software packages. And so uh, we're building this data as open data on the one end. We want to make sure we, we build them in a mode and way where we're not the, the central point of control. And we can share this data and everybody can use it and it can be shared further and uh, that applies both to package metadata, uh, origin information, license information, but also vulnerabilities. And to avoid uh, the issue of having a central point of control and, and uh, what we see today where most of these databases end up being proprietary. And I've been speaking very quickly and I had about 45 minutes and I'm 10 minutes short. So, questions? Yes? Yeah. Do you, should I scream? How many? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is he <laughs> talking about my hard skills? <laughs> yeah. No. I'll leave it to you. Um, so, I have two million questions, Philippe. Um, so, uh, how does. 
trying to teach you something. Louder. Um, does the Python integrate the cache in data, or does it always enter like high Python on the world to get fresh information? Can you can you repeat? So when when you so getting the benefits for for languages, you need to look at it somewhere. Typically, PyPyTorch organizes, and looking that up would take time. So do you catch the responses? Uh, within run, yes. Mm -hmm. Outside run, no. Okay. So so which means that if you run the command once, well actually, so. Because you run the command, by the time the command is finished, there's no cache. Cool. Um, I'll continue. Yeah. Keep going. Screen and chat. <laughs> um, can you read some of this, this source code, for example, in GitHub repository from PyPy package? Add PyPy. Can you repeat again? Can you read some of the source code? Not, not the source code as in the wheel itself, but the actual source code repository. Uh, so that's not in this tool specifically, uh, but there is uh, another thing that we call the package DB. Um, let me make sure I mean. You may say it's on love somewhere for me So it's another project uh, called the uh, package DB of Perl. Uh, all right, advanced. <sighs> Few certificates. What is this? All right, that's the Wi Fi. Okay. All right, there you go. So here. Um, so it's a database of the package metadata and what it has very specifically is that for each package we're trying to collect all the package metadata uh, from public registry stream. There's, there's about 20, 21 million ish at the moment. Um, we also collect all the package binaries and source and the corresponding version control package metadata. And each of these are then being scanned. So the, that's a long story. The short story is that, say, when you have a PyPI package, you may have a source distribution, uh, a wheel, or if it's a binary package that contains native code, 100 wheels, um, say LXML, for instance, has potentially 50 different, 60 different wheels with all different uh, operating system and architecture combinations. And we put all these in what we call the package set. And at query time, you're able to get the corresponding version control, git repo, the source distribution for a given wheel, or, or the other way around. And it's also used to uh, enrich the information both from the license, but also when you think about volume, it is being able to know uh, whether that applies to the binary and the source. So that was the, the, the long story. But the short story is yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, other questions? Yeah. Talk, talk to the microphone. <laughs> yes, uh, you were talking about um, core RF analysis and being able to detect which parts of the code base uh, are affected by the uh, vulnerable packages and the, if you have all in that uh, function at all. Um, but, but for Python, um, is it going to be possible for Python, given that it's um, a lot of the choices are going to run time, and I think it's a micro modification at run time, returning it to the same cycle? Yeah, so, so in general, it's, it's more of an art than a science. Um, so the question is is it possible to figure out uh, if a certain piece of code is being called or not? So it's an art and a science. The, the approach consists in first being able to find what is the segment of code that is vulnerable. And that means knowing what's the patch that introduced vulnerability and what's the patch that fixed the vulnerability. It's not a solved problem. There's, it's available in some cases, in many cases, we'll need to find a way as a community to ensure that we can track these fixed 
and introducing commits for a given moment. Once you have that, you can parse the corresponding code and see what is the, the entry point, say, recipe the name of a function in Python. And you can parse the code to uh, create a control flow and a code graph to figure out what are all the entry points to that. And that's on the, the vulnerable code side. On your code side, you will see whether you may call any of these entry points on this function. Again, if there's completely dynamic invocation, that's, that's where the artistic part comes in. It won't work, basically, when I say artistic. Uh, uh, in compiled language, in general, it may work. But again, even if you're using, say, DLOpen in, uh, in C, uh, there's, there's ways to, to bypass a lot of the things that would come out of static analysis. And there's not much we can do about it, but the point is that between not doing much all the times and doing something sometimes, there's a, there's a good benefit there. Take, uh, take the example of XZ again, so no, actually XZ is a bad example. <laughs> but uh, take the example, there's been uh, many OpenSSL vulnerabilities that were really severe in some context of usage and completely uh, unexpressed in others. So being able to know for certain that the code that's vulnerable is reachable and potentially using your app is, is really useful. Uh, there's an interesting project at uh, Eclipse called Eclipse Steady, uh, which does actually reachability analysis for Java and Python specifically, and is able to use also uh, assistance from the test suite meaning that it can find not only in static way, but also based on your run of the test suite whether the code that's vulnerable may be effectively reachable or not. Yeah, so, uh, 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 in the runtime, so, so that if you use a vulnerable part of the code, it immediately calls uh, uh, execution. Uh, I'm sorry, I... Have you looked at that? If you can repeat, I, I couldn't hear exactly what you meant. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, um, have you looked into runtime instrumentation of the code itself, such that if it does ever reach that part of time experience immediately, if it's something that's proven, that this is a vulnerability that the system might be really not sure because by different aspects, you can go and call methods, that might, uh, is that something you have uh, also considered as part of this work? Uh, not for now, not for now, because dynamic analysis is really, uh, in terms of level of complexity, is like several orders of magnitude uh, compared to pure static analysis. Uh, being able to solve with open source tools the pure static analysis part at first will already be a good thing and help a lot with triaging the vulnerabilities. And again, the point is not so much that uh, you'll get a perfect answer. Uh, but there's roughly about 100 new vulnerabilities published every day since the beginning of 2024. Uh, there's probably 30, 40-ish that apply to open source package, and it represents probably 10% of the really uh, serious vulnerabilities that exist out there. Meaning that as an open source developer, uh, I could spend three times my time every day triaging vulnerabilities. We're trying to find ways to, to, to lower, the, lower the, the, the effort, and static analysis is a good way for a start. Um, it can be automated, mostly, um, whereas dynamic analysis, uh, very quickly you need to start to have a sandbox, virtual machines, it can be automated to the, the, the level of ceremony you need to do to any kind of dynamic analysis goes very quickly up very fast. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We had a question over here, right? By the way, important thing, all these things are, of course, if we're not going to use uh, open source and open code, uh, we're trying to have uh, all of these. Right now, we're not advertising it too much, um, just because 
putting place infrastructure is, is a path order. But we're working, as I said, on these things called federated code, um, which is a way to distribute the data and advertise over activity pubs. So we're hacking essentially Mastodon uh, as a pub sub system to advertise about information about open source packages and Git as backing so Yeah, <clears throat> uh, thanks for the presentation. Really informative and thought provoking. Uh, and I have a question that uh, aims at specifically the vulnerability parts. So you talked a lot about other things as well, but in particular about vulnerability. So if I listen correctly, your suggestion that you run some tool locally and then you talk to many data databases and if you find that certain packages are vulnerable you just don't download them. But like in security there is mindset of shifting left that is starting protection earlier. And in that sense my question would be why package repositories would host the vulnerable packages at all? Like why don't they take them down so that nobody can download the vulnerable one? Like I'm sure you thought about that so I wonder like how you can explain this? Yeah, so I, I met them also to this tool called uh, 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 Scanbud.io, uh, which, which we use to analyze codes and spike lines. It's, it's all open source. Scanbud.io is just the name of the tool. It's not proprietary, it's not only hosted. Uh, if you remove packages and don't host vulnerable packages, you're making a lot of determination which are really difficult to do. Uh, for instance, here we have exe, the, the original uh, modified, well, not the original, the modified tarball that was released uh, on GitHub. And this is the original Git uh, checkout, which I got from uh, Debian, uh, or the other way around. The point is just finding these two. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, after uh, EXE was uh, made publicly known as being vulnerable, and when GitHub actually took down the repo and everybody else took down the repo, it was actually difficult. Uh, and the question is, when do you start? So in this case, it was really malware. You could say it's not really a vulnerability, it's malware. Uh, would GitHub, for instance, run a scan on every single tens or hundreds of millions of repos and decide that if there is a virus present in any of these repos, they will take down the repo. Difficult. Uh, eventually, yes, but on the other hand, there are cases where you don't want this, this information to be taken down and not available anymore. Uh, I know, for instance, with all the the log4j issues, all the vulnerable versions of log4j were taken down from uh, Maven Central. They're still available upstream in the uh, Apache Git repos, but no longer available uh, in, in Maven Central proper. It doesn't help anyway. Uh, as of today, there's about, depending on the evaluations, between 25 and 30 5% of uh, Java applications that use Log4j publicly that run vulnerable versions. I, so, so taking down may help. Uh, you would be forced to make a lot of very hard choice which may not be a uh, happy community choice in many cases. And it may help but it's probably not the long term solution. Uh, to give you an example, I have a friend that works in a very large um, company that provides cloud hosting and was put in charge of fixing the log for vulnerabilities back in uh, December 21. And it was in two days they had a solution to patch all of their customers' log for installation. And after a day of waiting, he received an answer from um, the executive management of this one. He says, we won't patch that. No, you won't patch the customer code with these things there. And the reason why they couldn't do that is that they have customers which are banks and, and financial institutions and, and process HR reports. 
And if you start patching their code, and imagine liability. It's like, why do you start there? Why, why, why wouldn't they fix any security issues and any bugs? So there's always this tension between doing the right thing, and I'm sure they did provide probably perimeter security to avoid that uh, the customers could uh, uh, be hacked uh, as much as possible. They still have about, uh, last I chatted with them, about 30% of their customers that run vulnerable version of our project. We're talking about something which is like two and a half years old or more. Um, so I, I think it's going to be very difficult. There's a few clear cut cases. The other thing we've not discussed much is that there's a whole gradation of vulnerabilities and a lot of junk stuff. Um, uh, there's been a lot of careful fall a few months ago with uh, uh, curl, for instance, CRL, where there were a lot of vanity vulnerabilities that were published, which really were just like junk vulnerabilities, and the only thing they served was to waste time of uh, fine Swedish uh, software developers <laughs> uh, um, on CRL nets. Um, and so the, when is it vulnerability? If, if you were to act on that, you would have taken down curl from, what, every single uh, distro repo? And I, I don't think it's a, it's a happy thing to do. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, so I think you mentioned earlier that your focus is on upstream package feeds. Um, but in practice, a lot of people do use downstream package software. You know, if, if, if we want to be able to you know, practically use this system, how, 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 how can we do that? Uh, which, which system in particular? Well, I'm thinking, for example, of distro package software. Yeah. You know, so a, a distro will, will repackage a library or an application. Um, you know, maybe their back backporting fixes. They're really their own unique um, builds of software yeah. in, in many cases. So, you know, I figure either you would have to be able to encode those those downstream built packages in PERS or you know reference them differently in Perl or something. How, how would the system account for downstream packaging? So each ecosystem has its own package type. Um, and if you look at the Perl spec, um, So this is a document which describes the types. In in a Perl, the type is this here, uh, the first segment after PKG. PKG is like HTTP for Perl. So each distro has eventually its own type, in some cases its own namespace. So if you think about, for instance, uh, let's look at uh, Debian, right? That's how you would identify, let me make this a bit bigger, That's how you would identify Debian versus you would package. And it can be down to the architecture uh, and the specific build, which means that you can have a very precise identification of the package. And this may be vulnerable to a vulnerability and the exact same version, but not the exact same build, maybe Fedora or Arch, will not be vulnerable to the same thing. Um, that's actually a problem today because uh, it's so it's still a problem in the sense we have this vulnerable, we, we have a way to do this distinction at the package level, uh, but there's still issues to relate all of this to a single vulnerability. And then you have a stream, 
and then you have, uh, in some case, downstream of this, uh, downstream further, when you have derivative of, say, uh, many derivative of Debian and, and Ubuntu, uh, which further combine the problems. There is support for that, with it solving, it's still a mess. We're trying to make it a bit less messy, at least. Yeah, yeah, of course. Just a tiny bit. Or, or maybe we're just adding to the mess, you know. And then I've got a quick second question for this time. Um, uh, what about cases where, you know, like a Python wheel, for instance, mm -hmm. will include other, you know, non Python artifacts inside, you know, tentacle cakes or packaging systems? <coughs> you know, wheels and you know. Well, that's a very good example. Um, nobody really worries too much about it. Uh, but take LXML, so it's it's uh, widely used XML processing library on, on Python, which could not be used at all if there were no XML, but we have to deal with XML for other words. You, you have this source distribution here, let me make this a bit bigger, and all the different versions here. And you see that some of these have very different size. You have 3.5 megabytes for the three, and it sounds weird that they are very different. In fact, if you look at the Windows version somewhere here, for instance, the bottom, and probably not this one, which is built for PyPI. Uh, but, well, actually, let's look at the two that are on the top. There's one that's built for Windows and C Python 3.12. It has a static reading copy of uh, LabXML2 and LabXLT inside. Nobody knows that, right? Uh, that's that's a real problem. The one below is statically linked with Muscle, which is a C library uh, design origin for uh, embedded devices, which is widely used in, in uh, Alpine models. Uh, so that these are two very good examples. There is no real good solution for this. Uh, I have a small project on the side, which is called Back to Source whose purpose is to run a scan between a source and its binaries, or source to source, and to find whether the match, uh, which uh, uh, is also nicely supported by NLNet. Um, and, and actually, uh, we were able to catch very modestly the fact there were discrepancies between the source of the XE and its uh, Git double. But the point is to do a lightweight reverse engineering between the source and the binaries. Uh, and then it has to be very te technology specific. So it will fully catch the fact that you have uh, statically linked or dynamically linked copy embedded of Muscle or uh, LXML, LibXML in these packages. But it's everybody, you know, there's so many problems. Everybody puts their, their head in the sand there. Uh, in the world of Java, for instance, it's very common to see what's called the Uber jars, or mega jars, which are jars which convey further dependencies, and everybody ignores it. Uh, you have copies of vulnerable uh, log4j, but you have also package released by Apache, which contains unattributed package under other licenses, which is also a problem, even from a license point of view. Um, at least we'll be able maybe to, to get some, some clarity on the topic. But, uh, that's not a project that may help a bit there, but it's a mess. It's a mess. And uh, Go is another example. Uh, so by the way, we, we built just a tool specifically for Go. But Go statically links every single package in one massive example, like that's Rust and Haskell mostly. And everybody just ignores the fact that there's all this software statically linked in one place and pretends it never happened. Yeah, definitely hard to Thank you. Thank you. We're running out of time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh,